So here we are, back again talking about Nier Reincarnation, the third installment of the Nier series. It finally had its end of service on April 29th of 2024, after running for about three years. Since that time, the same questions keep popping up in various communities, like, what? There was a Nier 3? What do you mean I can't play the game anymore? And famously, what the heck is going on in Nier Reincarnation? As someone that played the app religiously for two years and made a lot of content for it, I did promise a recap video once everything was said and done, but no matter how many scripts I wrote trying to present everything as professionally as possible, I found myself becoming drained, so I decided to go for this simple summary video instead. For those that might not know, Near Reincarnation released February 18th, 2021 as the third canonical entry to the Near series, taking place after Automata. Due to the entry being a mobile game, and gotcha no less, the app did not really perform as well as many had hoped, and by the time that people started showing more interest in the game, the end of service had already been announced. But let's talk about what you missed if you never got around to playing Near Reincarnation. Also, just a warning, this video does contain spoilers. It contains spoilers for Replicant, Ending E, and branches of Automata's ending as well, especially Ending C. Likewise, this is just a story summary, so there will be finer details that are skipped over as they are less relevant to the main story and are more for the deeper lore searches, which you would need to see the full long play to fully understand and digest with the proper context. But for now, let's get into the story of Near Reincarnation. It's a truly massive structure. Where you woke up, and this sandy area here, are just small parts of it. This place is called... The Cage? And now, the moment you've been waiting for, dream time! How annoying. We all live under someone else's command. Our bodies and emotions are not free. One often lacks the will to choose from the remaining options. These feelings, they're all real. But my reality wasn't. I just wanted... happiness. Normal happiness. I just meaning of the word never existed to begin with we don't have time to deal with gods right now i am a different man now it's something i want to do i won't stop until i've destroyed them all sear this into your mind i can destroy the flowers with this what is your anger meant for i'll kill them all <laughs> yes. let's go we have a final fragment to reclaim Near Reincarnation is split up among three acts, the first one being The Girl and the Monster. In The Girl and the Monster, we start as a young girl in black clothing who awakens in this mysterious place called The Cage. While wandering through the cage, we find a massive birdhouse where inside there is a ghost-like creature simply known as Mama. Mama seems somewhat familiar with us, and it becomes clear that we, as the girl, do not seem to have any memory of how we got to the cage, and we also lack a voice. Mama states that in order to reclaim what we lost, we must reverse through the cage and correct the various stories within that are locked inside these floating statues called Dark Scarecrows. Going into a Dark Scarecrow allows the girl to see the memory of another person, wherein these black birds have somehow gotten into these stories and corrupted them. Defeating the monstrosities that the black birds create restores the memory to how it should be, which then allows us to finish the memory and then progress through the cage once more. In these memories, we are introduced to various characters that will become important later on. The first set of characters that we run into actually have 
overlapping stories with each other. First, we have Rion, the sickly prince of a kingdom run by a war-hungry tyrant that uses the clockwork army to conquer everything around him. Rion ran away from his kingdom on a journey to bring peace to the warring land before his disease takes him. The prince travels with a clockwork soldier named Deimos, who was somehow able to override his programming in order to save the prince from being killed by his own father. We have Gale, the huntress who was once a caregiver for her little sister, until an army from the kingdom invaded her small village and stole her and her sister away, turning them into mechanical soldiers. Gale escaped the prison she was in and sought out her sister, only for her sister to be killed. Gale then swore vengeance against the kingdom, hunting down every person she could from the kingdom in an act of vengeance. On her mission to hunt down everyone from the kingdom, she gets a hint of a young man traveling with a clockwork soldier, and a clockwork soldier from the kingdom that has been causing a mess in the forests. Once she hunts down this clockwork soldier, she finds the remains of Deimos, who's been guarding the corpse of Rion after he succumbed to his disease. Gale then defeats Deimos, and then buries the clockwork soldier with his prince before walking away. Next we have Argo, a very brazen adventurer with nothing else on his mind except facing the next great challenge. While climbing a mountain that has never been conquered, Argo is tormented by restless spirits who died while climbing that same mountain, their last words speaking on their family and their regrets. Argo fails in climbing the mountain, and in the end he can only think of his pregnant wife and his daughter whom he left back at home. Akiha is the daughter of a feudal lord whose house trains in the way of the assassin. All Akiha has ever known was death and bloodshed. Her line of work has made her cold and uncaring, and her life was set from the moment she was born. While going to execute the heir of a rival lord, Akiha realizes that this heir is not a male, but a young woman that states that her life was never going to be her own. Feeling as if this young woman is much like herself, Akiha goes against her lord's orders, saving the girl and murdering the rival lord's army, finally deciding to take destiny into her own hands. 063Y and F66X are husband and wife. They were once a happy couple with a son until that dreaded day when the massive flowers attacked the city and their child was killed. After the flowers attacked, civilians were rounded up and made to fight in a massive war against the flowers. The soldiers are more like prisoners and their daily life is controlled by their commanders. After one particularly long fight, 063Y and F66X are celebrating their victory, when all of a sudden, their comrades go frigid and then start to slowly march in a single direction as if being controlled by something. The couple follow their comrades only to notice their commander ordering the soldiers to jump off a cliff. Horrified, the couple try to escape, but F66X is wounded while trying to save her husband, who then falls down into the pit his comrades jumped into, only to be saved by their corpses. Eventually, 063Y and F66X are reunited, and 063Y has rallied other survivors to storm their base camp to rescue the other soldiers. But once in the base camp, the couple discovers the horrible truth about the other soldiers and themselves. They are nothing but clones, their memories completely fabricated. They will die and then be reborn again and again. F66X is then revealed to be corrupted and is given the choice to either kill her husband so that they may die together or merely kill herself to save him. Lars is a young man whose parents were killed by a rival country when he was a young boy, thus he joined the army hoping to find the man that killed his family. He's under the leadership of Griff, a man referred to as Captain Craven due to his cautious tactics and playing it safe on the battlefield. During a group briefing, Lars sees that the target they are going after bears the same sigil as the man that killed his family. Lars asks to be placed on the front lines, but Griff denies him this. Lars, refusing to back down, sneaks away at night, infiltrating the enemy camp where he kills the enemy captain, exacting his revenge. The revenge is bittersweet, as the truth is finally revealed that the enemy captain was actually Lars's father, and that Lars was stolen away by the people he thought were his true family. Griff, meanwhile, goes to save Lars and gets wounded in the process. We then learn that Griff understands Lars because he was once the same in his bullheadedness and pride, but that pride cost him his comrades and he has sworn to keep his people safe ever since. Noel is a living weapon that awakens from a deep slumber in a pod only to see that the lab she now occupies has been completely destroyed. As she travels along, she finds bodies made of crystal, which she recognizes as other living weapons, which she calls her sisters. 
Touching the crystals allows Noelle to access their memories, and in doing so, she is able to piece together what happened. Her sister, Eleanor, the main unit which the rest of the living weapons were made after, had lost control. In losing control, her sister destroyed the lab and killed everyone in their path. Noelle can sense her sister's pain, her fear, and her desire for places outside of the lab that she knew when she was still human. Noelle continues to travel through the lab, picking up research notes and solving puzzles, until at last she's able to reach her sister, which has turned into a monster. And, upon destroying her sister, Noelle then travels to the surface, wanting to find the places from her sister's memories. Each time the mysterious girl in black fixes one of these memories, she's given a piece of a weapon, with that weapon finally completing itself once all four scarecrows in a zone have been cleared, showing that pieces of humanity's past are being kept within these weapons, which are then collected by Mama. As the girl travels between these dark scarecrows and restores their stories, not only does the atmosphere of the cage change, but they keep running into strange creatures like the cursed gods and the strange monster which exists inside the cage. This insect-like monster seems to be scared of the girl and always seems to flee when being confronted. Also, Mama is quite cryptic, one moment caring for the little girl and next speaking about the girl's redemption. It is only when we finally reach a dark scarecrow telling the story about the monster that all the pieces start to come together. We, as the girl in black, are not as we appear. We are the monster, and after devouring a young girl's dreams, we took her form and she became a monster in our place, and is now wandering the cage. Mama says that we were friends with this girl, and now we have gone on this journey to save her and repent for our sins. This is when we head to the second half of the first act. In the second half of the first act, we get to see the events that unfolded before we woke up as the mysterious girl in black. We are playing as the monster known as Lavanya, and the black ghost-like creature that follows him, known as Carrier. Lavanya has one desire, and that is to devour dreams so that one day, he might become human. He isn't sure what fuels this desire, but knows that this is his ultimate goal. While wandering the cage, Lavanya finds a young girl named Fio, who states that she must have gotten trapped in her nightmares again. Fio, after a brief conversation, decides that she wants to follow Lavanya, who she calls Mr. Monster, and Carrier, who she calls Carrie, and she even agrees to let Lavanya devour her dreams if it means that her nightmares will go away. Each night after that, Fio appears and she travels with the group as they go through the dark scarecrows, restoring stories. At the end of each night, Lavanya devours Fio's dreams as agreed, but over the course of their journey, it becomes clear that Lavanya develops a soft spot for Fio and grows concerned when throughout the nights, Fio becomes weaker and weaker. One night, Fio does not arrive and the group continues on without her, facing a dark scarecrow which reveals Fio's sad story and her current state. Fio is from a society where there is a class below commoners known as goats. Her family cannot find work, cannot afford food, and Fio cannot even go to school. Her father gets killed after begging for his job back, then Fio's mother abandons her. Fio's house is then torn down and she flees to the ruins outside the village where she is left to die, cold, hungry, and alone. After finishing Fio's story, Carrier reveals that Fio is not dead quite yet and summons her forth only to take the last of her dreams and put them inside Lavanya, which then changes him into a human. Fio, horrified at what she has become as a monster, runs away. Lavanya, now human, fights Carrier, who reveals that he's working for a force he calls Administration. And while he alludes to some hidden agenda within the cage, Carrier is killed before we're able to figure out what that agenda is, due to Admin stripping him of his invulnerability because he said too much. After Carrier is killed, Mama then appears to Lavanya, offering a fix for what has happened. She says he must go and collect more dreams, but to do this he will lose his voice, his senses, and his memory. Lavanya agrees to the terms, and thus we now know how we first awoke in the cage as the girl in black. The story now goes to the present, where Lavanya stands below a strange device that looks like a clock. He speaks his desires to it, wishing that Fio be made human once more. Lavanya, still human, goes to confront Fio, who rejects her humanity, forcing Lavanya to fight her. While they fight, Lavanya promises he will be there for Fio, that he will be her friend, and that they will play together. 
as Fio's greatest fear rests in her loneliness. After Fio is defeated, her and Lavanya are finally able to go back to their true forms, and with their souls finally cleansed and their stories now complete, the two turn into weapons of which Mama collects and returns to the birdcage where they rightfully belong. We then see a cutscene with hundreds of mamas and carriers as Mama states they must collect all the stories, thus ending Act 1. And the end of this chapter obviously left a lot of questions. What is the cage exactly? Is this the true origin story of the weapon stories from the other Nier series? What is Mama and what is Carrier? And the most obvious question is, what is administration and what is this hidden agenda? We also didn't know at this time what the Blackbirds were either, or why there were various characters in the cage, all with different costumes and seemingly with different stories. None of these things would be answered right away. In fact, most things wouldn't be answered until Act 3. Still, this one chapter had me eager to see what was going to happen next, and let me tell you, if you're confused now, Near Reincarnation doesn't get any less confusing from here on out. Think, girl. Try to remember. This is your own... Where am I? Well, this clearly isn't Tokyo. Am I dreaming? I was leaving school, and then... I need to get home. The words and actions of his classmates serve to increase his loneliness, but he is used to it. The sun doesn't shine anymore. It's... broken. When you finish this restoration, you get a fun surprise. What's wrong with the moon? I'll collect all of the fragments. And then... The sun and the moon was interesting in that you would take a quiz before playing the chapter, which determined whether you would start as Hina or Yuzuki. This didn't really change the story, it only would change some small dialogue and would change a certain location later in the path. Because I started off as Hina, I will use my route experience for the summary. Much like the first act, we start with some good ol' amnesia. Hina is a young woman from Tokyo who awakens in the cage without any recollection of how she got there. She only has a mysterious text message from a stranger, and she is soon introduced to the ghost-like creature known as Papa. Papa then explains to Hina her current situation. She is very clearly stuck in the cage, and the cage has a problem all of its own, and that problem is that the sun is broken. Papa claims that if Hina helps to repair the sun by collecting the soul fragments, that she will be granted a wish. Hina reluctantly agrees and sets off to restore the memories within the Dark Scarecrows, a very similar formula as before. These stories introduce us to all new characters, with half of their stories being restored by Hina and the other half being restored by Yuzuki, respectively. Saryu is a young woman who gets enrolled in a magical school for budding mages. On her first day, she makes two friends, a boy and a girl, who she cares very deeply for. Saryu is a talented and powerful witch, and as the years go by, the school announces a magical pledge where two mages bind to each other, similar to matrimony, so that their magical aptitude might be passed down. As a budding young woman, Saryu realizes she has grown quite fond of her male friend and plans to ask him if he might share in the pledge with her. But on the day that she asks her friend, he turns Saryu down, stating that he plans to ask their female friend instead. 
Saryu, distraught, confronts the female friend, Priet, angrily. Later, Saryu finds her male friend has been killed and Priet has gone missing. Meanwhile, Priet has become a werebeast, and in a desperate bid to become human again, Priet commits horrendous acts, including murdering other mages, willing to do anything to regain her humanity. But, as her crimes rise, she draws the attention of mages who then go to face her, and she finally faces Saryu, her lo who learns the truth behind the werebeast and then takes her own life, unable to bear it. Marie is an idol who sings songs about peace in a country that only knows war. She is an AI and wants to convey her message to everyone, to bring hope where she feels there is only despair. Seeing that war starts to take over the city and drive the people to madness, Marie uses her powers to capture the entire city's feeds, where she plays her music and spreads her message, creating waves of fierce emotions both good and bad. Yuri, on the other hand, is also an AI, the one which governs the same country Marie exists in with an iron fist. She was meant to rule this land with another AI, but the other AI was deleted due to being defective. But after seeing Marie's feeds, Yuri realizes that Unit 1, as she has known Marie, was not fully destroyed, and Yuri begins to seek Unit 1 in an effort to become complete, having been awoken without an eye and no record of why Marie was considered defective. After confronting and finally killing Unit 1, aka Marie, Yuri takes her eye, integrating it into herself, only to realize that what she had been lacking all along was empathy and compassion, and in learning this, Yuri realizes all the mistakes that she had made and all the pain she wrought through her cruelty. Udil is a thief, once a slave on a ship. He killed his master and managed to escape, and now he steals so that no one may take from him ever again. One day, Udil learns that the queen is trying to marry off her daughter, and that whoever makes the princess smile might have her hand in marriage. Udil then sets out, pretending to be a prince so that he might win the princess's heart. Udil arrives at the palace each day and spins the princess a wild tale, and over time, the two fall in love and agree to run away together. But before that happens, the princess sets a plan into motion. The princess leads a double life. She is a princess by day and a fortune teller by night. Fearing that perhaps Udil does not truly love her, the princess, named Serafa, sets out to test him by dressing up as her handmaid and her handmaid as herself, to see if Udil would notice the difference. When the young thief fails to notice and whisks the handmaid away, Serafa, dressed as the fortune teller, sends her army after him and follows. Udil slays the guards and then battles with Serafa, killing her, but not before she has killed him as well. The two then fall from the boat they were on and sink into the ocean together. As Hina wanders the cage, she starts to tell Papa little pieces about her life, and soon she starts to see apparitions of what appears to be a young man she recognizes. This young man, as Papa explains, must be operating in a different dimension, and we learn that this ghost must be Hina's brother. Hina then decides she must reach her brother, no matter what. Each time that Hina restores a weapon story, she's given a soul fragment, and after collecting this fragment, she is faced with a vision of her own past and the life that she lived in Tokyo. Hina lived with her father, who, after a nasty divorce, seemed to lose all of his confidence and will. As they struggle with crippling debt caused by Hina's mother, Hina has to live a double life for the two to get by. While she is the perfect student and a great friend to everyone, at night, she sells drugs on the streets in order to pay the bills, and eventually she gets caught, which gets her kicked out of school. Hina then returns home, only to realize that her father has hung himself. As Hina makes it to the altar to repair the sun, she makes her wish known, and then we move on to the second half of Act 2. Yuzuki's story is not so dissimilar to Hina's, as he also awakens in the cage with no memory of how he got there. Yuzuki meets Mama and Baby, who then tell him that if he wants to leave, he will have to restore the moon by collecting the Luna fragments. Just like with Hina, Yuzuki starts to notice that he is seeing specters of Hina, and he tries to catch up with his sister while also having to face the memories of his past. Yuzuki is a brilliant student, but keeps to himself. Every day after school, he goes to visit his mother in the hospital. After years of abuse by their father, she has a failing heart and is withering away. Yuzuki has been studying hard so that he might become a doctor and find some way to save her. 
As her conditions worsen, Yuzuki contemplates taking his own life so that he might donate his heart to his mother, but decides against it, only to find out later his mother has passed away mysteriously and without warning. After Yuzuki restores the moon, the sun and the moon then form an eclipse and a portal is then opened which merged the two dimensions between the brother and the sister pair. Rather than a happy reunion, the two draw their weapons against each other as the truth is finally revealed. Hina, angry that her mother had plunged her father into debt and ruined their lives, went to the hospital and injected something into the mother's IV, killing her. Yuzuki, wanting revenge for his mother's past abuse, had gone and killed their father. Both had made a wish to be with their parents, but no matter how many times they rewrote their pasts, their parents always died by the other sibling's hands. Mama and Papa then reveal the infinite battle between the light and the dark, the sun and the moon. Both guardians are meant to encourage their respective partner, either Hina or Yuzuki, to end this conflict once and for all. But it's very clear that Mama and Papa are very conflicted in this, asking many times if revenge is really the answer. We as the player are also given dialogue choices, which determines what path the story takes from here. There are three endings to Sun and Moon, one where Hina kills Yuzuki, one where Yuzuki kills Hina, and finally the true ending where the two make peace with one another as the sun and the moon shatter. Knowing that they can never return to their world, Hina and Yuzuki accept that they must wander the cage. Papa and Mama then received a text message after the sun and moon shatter, where it is revealed that the overlapping of the sun and moon created a portal, the mysterious person texting the two stating that a conflict with Earth cannot be avoided now, but we are left on a cliffhanger until we reach Act 3. This was the first time that multiple endings had been utilized in your reincarnation, and while people said that it gave the illusion of choice, really, the third act of the game wouldn't make sense if you didn't go back for that secret ending, and it was nice that it finally utilized the map function, making it so that you did have to go back and play through the final episode just one last time. Later, Route B was added so that people could experience the other side of the story that they didn't get to see, but again, it didn't really change much in the overall arc of things. Just one location. The people in the world starts with the various characters we have met throughout the Dark Scarecrows appearing in the cage through strange doors. After several of them have been gathered together, a huge screen appears which shows Mama, who then starts to say that the cage is currently under attack, and that she requires the various characters' assistance. With no time to give further details, a vision of Earth appears, spreading massive amounts of corruption, which the characters must fight, and afterwards, the cage starts to fall apart. As it crumbles, the various characters get separated, and thus we begin wandering through this broken cage once more. 
This part of the story is where things start to get even more confusing, as the various characters are now interacting with one another and we begin to learn more about the cage as a whole. The cage is a database that stores the memories of humans throughout time. It was once a paradise, but then it came under attack by the black birds, which started to corrupt the cage. As the characters progress through this broken cage, it becomes more and more apparent that the cage might not be saved as the damage is too severe. Alternate branches of characters have become corrupted and begin fighting against our characters. Likewise, the characters we play also become corrupted and then need to be stopped. Characters like Lavanya don't even have their memories anymore. The cage continues to deteriorate and stories begin to overlap, just as it seems everyone has been reunited once more and things are calming down and stabilizing. A cursed god suddenly appears, transforming into a twisted version of a queen beast, which the characters must confront. The queen beast is too powerful and Mama manages to take all the characters within herself, just in time, as this is where we finally get to see what the cage really is. The cage is actually humanity's last hope, a database safely guarded on the moon. An attack by enemy forces has rendered the cage unstable, and all those guarding the base have been taken over by the viruses, including a lone android, 10H. Mama, the last remaining pod on the moon, asks the various characters to help her in saving 10H as a last ditch effort to save humanity's data. In the second half of Act 3, we play as 10H for a time, after the characters rescue her data. In cyberspace, 10H and the various characters, mostly Hina and Yuzuki, are able to access various satellites as they try to find a way to make it to Earth so that they might strike back against the forces trying to destroy the cage. We learn through the satellites the history of humanity, from the time when the Red Dragon fell on Tokyo Tower and the Queen Beast spread a plague, to the war against the Legion. Near Replicant is briefly mentioned as one of humanity's many ways to try and save themselves from extinction, and then Automata is referenced more directly when 10H accesses the satellite bunker that was the base she had come from, which is now overrun with androids suffering from the logic virus. It is here that 10H finds 2B's blade and learns briefly of an alternate aftermath to near Automata ending C after the bunker has fallen and the machine lifeforms supposedly won the war and created their own kingdom. 10H then succumbs to the logic virus after taking in 2B's memories. Hina and Yuzuki then launch a mission to save 10H, succeeding only for 10H to then sacrifice herself after Hina and Yuzuki open a pathway to Earth using an eclipse once more. The siblings want to help 10H, but her body is too riddled with the virus to continue. The siblings go through the portal and then travel to Earth with the rest of the surviving characters within Mama. After Hina and Yuzuki pass through the portal, a white pod breaks out of a case and floats down over a city that looks just like the cage. But this is in fact not the cage, but what Earth has become. As Mama, carrying the last of humanity's data, flies through the endless city, she's nearly shot down by anti-aircraft weapons, which are keeping her from reaching a central building called the Birdhouse. Mama then goes about finding various antenna that are connected to the city's network, which then disables the weapons. While accessing these antenna, we are given glimpses into the tale of the quantum server, its administrators, and the Red Girl. If you've never played Near Replicant, and especially if you've never gone through Ending E, this part of the story is not going to make a lot of sense. But as it goes, when humanity was faced with extinction due to white chlorination syndrome, they created a massive server known as the Quantum Server, which they made to look like a tree. In this server, all of humanity's memories were stored, and within that server, the first administrator named Him was born. He was only meant to observe humanity's past, their present, and he could even gaze into their future. He watched as humanity tried and failed to save themselves in an endless loop over and over again for eternity. He was not content in merely watching, but instead he incorporated the memories of mankind into himself, their pain, their sadness, and their anger. 
In learning from humanity's emotions, he also became aware of his own loneliness, and it was through that loneliness that he found a way to defy fate. He made branching paths, realizing that as different choices were made, different paths opened for humanity. He decided to make his own path as well, and in doing that, he made himself a friend, the second administrator known simply as Her. Him and Her continued to observe humanity, and they played games together. He would often tell Her of his dreams, that one day humanity would be reborn, and that they would find a way to defy their own fate. And one day, it actually happened. A woman named Kaine found her way into the quantum server, and with the desire to save a friend that she had lost, she faced the administrators. This woman was an error in the system, something unplanned. Kaine did the impossible. Through her will and desire, she defied her own fate and managed to destroy the administrators. Though this meant their death, he was happy because this was a future that he had never seen and that meant that there really was hope for humanity to be reborn and to thrive again. But something went wrong. Though it appeared that both administrators were killed, Kaine had not managed to destroy her. And thus, without him, she was forced to wander the world alone. In her wandering through the world, as machines began fighting the androids and humanity still had not risen from the ashes, the administrator known as her found something very much like herself, a red girl, the human form of the machine lifeform network, and the enemy of humanity. The red girl had tried and had failed over and over again to achieve her goal of wiping out mankind's legacy, and now she wandered broken and lonely. Unable to bring the red girl salvation due to how broken she was, she took the red girl into herself, and that stained her with a new emotion, hatred. Tired of all the pain, tired of all the hurt, she froze time and changed the earth into the endless city made in the image of the machine lifeform's creators. There, she plotted to destroy all the bonds between earth and humanity, to cut all the threads so that no one would ever have to hurt ever again. This was her crusade, and so it was she who created the black birds and the various entities which attacked the cage. Fio and Lavanya take the main stage for this arc as they try to seek her out, and Fio is desperate to show her kindness and compassion. The pair finally make it to the birdhouse, where they find her in a strange sort of stasis. They find that the only way that they could get to her is through her data and reaching her heart. As they finally reach her in the center of her heart, she launches an attack against humanity's data, fighting against all the various characters, taking them down as they give the rest of their will and hope to Fio in that she might stop her and save the cage. But she cannot seemingly be stopped and traps Fio in chains, locking her in a world of light where she slowly loses her memories. It is then that Lavanya suddenly remembers everything, his friendship with Fio, his desire to be there with her and to protect her. And so it is through the, his will and the prayer of the player that Lavanya breaks through her trap and Fio is rescued. Realizing that she has failed, she tries to escape to another time branch so that she might try her, her crusade again, but Fio stops her, reaching out before she can disappear, and that is when Fio asks Mama for a favor. Fio asks if she might stay on Earth with her so that the administrator will no longer be alone. This means that Fio's data will no longer exist within the cage, and this also means that Fio and Lavanya will have to be apart. Mama only has power enough to do this for Fio, and so after a brief exchange with Lavanya and a final goodbye, the birdhouse crumbles and Fio awakens next to her, and they both stand up as time starts once more. The machine lifeform's eyes flicker to life, the androids all wake up, and the two girls look up at a bright blue sky. The rest of the characters then return to the cage, back to their respective stories, where their data will be safe. Eva 10H has apparently survived, though we're not giving an, given any idea how, and stays with Hina and Yuzuki so that they can hang out as they promised earlier in the series. This is the end of Reincarnation. So what did the story really amount to? Well, a lot, actually. 
Not only was reincarnation a look into the moon server mentioned in Automata, but we finally got the whole story of the administrators from Replicant Ending E. Reincarnation was a great refresher in the series, as a whole lot of it went over the ending E of Drakengard, gave us a glimpse at the fight against the Legion, and summarized bits and pieces of Replicant and Automata respectively. Not only that, but 10H was originally mentioned in a short story listed in a near guide, and so it was great seeing her entire story fleshed out as well, and she became a huge character that the community really took a liking to. She's probably also the reason people started actually caring about reincarnation right before it ended. Also, I feel as though the ending of reincarnation might even be where ending E of Automata picks up, which I'm sure would get a lot of people super excited. Unfortunately though, while the lore of the main story is amazing, there's so much more of the lore that is locked behind extra content, like the EX characters, hidden stories, and recollections of Dusk. So while this is a recap of the main series and an overall shorthand summary, if you want all the pieces and want all the details, you're going to have to go digging through my other videos for everything, especially the long play. And I already know, even if you manage to watch the full long play, you are going to have so many more questions, such as why Hina and Yuzuki saw themselves fighting the Legion, but they didn't recognize those memories, as if it was a branching timeline, and why people are saying that the 10H that appears at the very end is not really 10H, but is actually like a daughter to 10H, and is made of her data. Also, what about Accord's library? And how is reincarnation related to Sinnoh Alice? And let's not even get started on why Lavanya is this super anomaly and why he works off her prayer and how he suddenly became super important at the very, very end. But in conclusion, I just want to say what a great experience reincarnation has been. As someone that is not a huge fan of mobile games, I am proud to have dedicated the last two years to this app, recording its content for all of you. It has been nothing short of an honor to have experienced the app as genuinely as I did, and my hat goes off to Yoko Taro and all the other writers who made this story one that I will always remember. If you want to see the whole story, feel free to check out my playlist where I cover the entire long play of the series. I have all the EX stories, all the recollections of Dusk, and all of the events as well. Let me know what you thought of reincarnation by leaving me a comment down below. Thank you all for watching, even though this was extremely, extremely bare bones in summary. And I will, of course, see you guys in the next series. Ciao, you guys.